Okay, watch regrets are the worst. They're expensive and they hurt this different part of your soul. I've made this list based on some of the regrets I have and some of the regrets my friends and other people have had. So here's five watches you will always regret buying. So fashion watches are fashion designer branded watches. I'm thinking of Michael Kors, Gucci, Versace, Hugo Boss, Armani. And these watches have gained a bad rap for three main reasons. One, the prevalence of quartz. Two, the generic derivative design language. And three, they are a horrible value for money. So these are really just fashion design houses leveraging their name, reputation, and brand identity to sell you bad watches for a massive premium. Now, even though I wouldn't recommend buying a fashion watch, I feel like I should say that I understand why people buy them. And I think there's a plethora of people who are now into watches whose journey began with a fashion watch. When I was in university, it was around the time of peak Daniel Wellington. <laughs> so these minimal design quartz watches that at the time retailed for about $200 Canadian, which was way out of my ballpark as a theology student in Vancouver. But I remember I bought a watch from Aldo. It must have been $20. It, it looked like this. And it was by no means a nice watch. But I remember I was so proud to have a watch and I thought it looked nice. I think fashion watches might be a lot of people's gateway in to liking a watch or seeing themselves wearing a watch. But with just a little bit more research and time, you can find watches around the same price point that aren't pieces you'll regret buying. I'm thinking of brands like Timex, Seiko, Casio, or one of my favorite watches that I don't talk about enough on the channel, the Orient Bambino. Okay, I feel like this is a section that's gonna get me in a little bit of trouble here, but I truly, truly never recommend someone to buy a watch for the investment poten <laughs> investment potential. You can do it, you can say it, Brit. The big reason I recommend against this is that we just don't know what the future holds. We don't know what the biggest watches will be in 20 years time, even in a year's time. I remember coming out of the pandemic and even at the height of the pandemic, there was loads of watch YouTube channels saying, oh, buy these, you gotta buy these now. They're never gonna go down. Look at how much it's already increased in value. You're a dummy if you're not buying these right now. And a year later, secondary watch prices fell off a cliff. The truth is we just don't know what the future holds. If you're buying a $10,000 watch, a $30,000 watch as an alternative asset class, solely in the hopes that it will accrue value, I'd be very careful with that. Watches are only worth what the next person will pay for them. And I'd be especially careful if the cost of the watch would be a devastating amount of money to lose. This is not a game. <laughs> I would not be playing this game. Now, don't get me wrong, your watches will never become worthless. One of the awesome things about buying watches is that they'll always hold some kind of value. So when you do go to sell them on, you still will be getting something. Sometimes it's more yay, sometimes you break even, and sometimes they devalue quite significantly. <laughs> There are some of those crazy stories like with the Rolex Daytona. So when these were first released, watch dealers couldn't give these away. In fact, legend has it that Rolex used to give these away for free if you purchased another watch. And now, many, many years later, the Daytona is one of the hardest models to get and the vintage models are some of the most coveted in the world. But no one could have predicted that. As cliche as it sounds, and you all knew it was gonna come at some point in this section, buy what you love and you'll never be disappointed. Don't buy for the investment. It's just too fickle. Now this is somewhat related to don't buy for the investment, but don't buy just for the hype or because of the hype. This can be quite difficult if you're someone like me who's been sipping on that Rolex Kool-Aid. And a lot of the times when you maybe get the call on the watch, it might be the first time you're seeing this watch in the metal. I've shared this before, actually quite recently, but there was a time I nearly bought a watch just because of the hype. So I had my name down for it. I finally got the call on it. And when I'd seen it in the metal for the first time and, and tried it on, it just wasn't right for me. I loved the watch. That's why I put my name down for it, but I'd never tried it on before. But now that it was on my wrist, it wasn't quite right. 
and I could feel myself trying to make myself like it because it was so hype and not a lot of people get the call on this. So I was like, come on, Brittany, you should be so lucky. Why don't you like it? There's a reason why everyone likes this. And I almost talked myself into buying it but I realized for me to say yes to this watch that I didn't even really want anymore after having it in would be saying no to someone else who would truly love this watch. It would be right for them and they would be chuffed to bits to bring it home. Okay, this is always something I recommend. Don't purchase the non-bracelet variation of a watch just to save a little bit of money. You will almost always regret it. If there's a variation of a watch on a bracelet, I will always choose the bracelet. It is quite easy and affordable to buy an aftermarket strap or to even purchase one from the manufacturer, but it's quite a bit more difficult and pricey to purchase the bracelet afterwards. When looking into watches, one thing to consider is the lug width, so the space between the two lugs where the bracelet is. The easiest and most common strap sizes are 20 millimeters, 18 millimeters, and 22 millimeters. But of course, some brands insist on making it strange sizes like 21 mil. Cartier, it hit me with 15.5 mil. Wow. Just a quick little fast one here. Buy on the bracelet if you can. Last but not least, if you look at a watch and think, what would I wear this with? How could I style this? And there's nothing you could think of in your wardrobe that you think you could comfortably wear with this. It might just not be right for right now. There are some absolute icons of the watch world that are kind of daunting to style, especially if you're more of a casual person. I'm thinking of the JLC Reverso, the Cartier Tank, Cartier Santos, Breguet Classique, Nomos Tanganta. I'm personally a bit of a weirdo. I'm the other end of the spectrum. I find it quite easy to wear and style dress watches. The more daunting proposition for me would be something like the Sea Dweller. And even a lot of G-Shocks just don't really suit my everyday style. Everyone's style is a bit different. Everyone's comfort levels are a little bit different. If it doesn't suit your style or you just can't think of times where you would practically wear this, maybe it's just not right for you. Anyways, those are my five watches you will always regret buying. Did I miss anything big? Any regrets you have, pop them in those comments down below. Don't forget to do all those juicy, delicious things to feed the YouTube algorithm gods. Subscribe if you're not subscribed, come on now. And let's thank the gorgeous, amazing Pope Tier patrons. Hey guys, editing Brittany here to thank the gorgeous, amazing, fabulous Pope Tier patrons. You see these names on the screen? They're the most amazing, fantastic people ever. Well, to be honest with you, all tier patrons are the most amazing, fantastic. Uh, but the names on the screen are the Pope Tier patrons, the highest tier patrons, who always get a special shout, shout out at the end of each video. Thank you so much, patrons. Thank you to our newest patrons, who you'll see kind of near the end. Am I pointing the right way? I hope I am. Thank you all to your patrons, though.